Welcome to Snail Mail Tales. That is fun to say. Just go ahead and say it. Come on. That's fun. We've been reading some New Testament letters. These are ancient pieces of mail. They would have been written on papyrus and carted about the Roman Empire, the Mediterranean. We've been probing some questions to help us acquaint ourselves with this biblical genre. We've been wrestling with issues of who wrote what to whom and why. And we've also been dealing with what kind of letter, right? The, 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 the issue of genre. Today, we're going to take a look at a, uh, a piece of mail. Maybe you haven't tarried over much. I actually don't remember recalling ever hearing a sermon or Bible study on the book of Jude. And there may be a reason for that. You see, Jude is a little spicy. Jude is a little rude. So we're going to get into that. What is up with this guy? He's like slinging insults all over the place. I don't know if you've read the book. It will take you about four minutes to read the book of Jude. It's tiny. It's 25 verses long. All right. So guys, why don't we read the book of Jude real quick and then we'll dive into it. Are you ready to open this very strange and disorienting and short piece of mail from the ancient church? Here we go. Oh, you're back so soon. It was a quick read, wasn't it? So what was that all about? Has anybody left wondering a lot of different questions about the book of Jude? Who is Jude? As we can see here from the first verse, that Jude is someone who claims to be a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. And you guys remember our last letter we looked at. Who was James? James was the younger brother of Jesus. So guys... I don't, I don't know if you knew this, but Jesus had another brother, Jude, as one of these early church leaders who is, in fact, writing this letter. And who is he writing to? He is writing to a broad audience. Those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. So he's writing to perhaps a very broad audience of churches who are dealing with something he has an eye out for. Something that's giving him a great cause of concern. Did you hear the urgency of this letter. Did you hear his message? That somebody is in the church that is causing him great concern. I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith, for certain people have crept in. Anybody else a little nervous? Certain people have crept in? Something's going on in this church that is drawing Jude's attention in a urgent and quite negative way. These people are actually taking away from what God is doing in the church. Part of the issue that we're, we're dealing with in reading the epistles is understanding their context. It's in the context of a relationship that this guy has between him and, and this church family, or a series of church families, or he's aware about something going on, and in the, in the, uh, there's a problem for all of the church families, and he sees an issue. Wolves in sheep's clothing? Who are these shady people? You know, there's a lot of shady people in scripture, and a lot of them take the position of leadership. That's the concern. We see this with Paul. Uh, early on in, in Acts 15, we have this group of people in scripture that want Gentiles, aka non-Jewish believers uh, of Christ, to become Jews in order to be saved in Christ. And that simply isn't the gospel message, but that's how they interpreted the gospel message. They're actually a faction that gains power, and they actually send people to churches in order to try to convince those churches to submit to that teaching. So they're problematic because they're, they're actually presenting a gospel that the Bible doesn't present itself. Uh, we see this in, in Paul's letter to Galatia. They show up there. You know, he calls them false teachers. We see it in the letter we went through in Philippi. He even called them dogs, right? Even in that joyful letter he wrote from prison, he's using quite tough language to describe these shady leaders who are not teaching the right thing. So I just want you to hear this. The harshest language we see in the New Testament even from Jesus, from Paul, from Jude, all of these people that are that are anxious about something happening in the church and they use harsh language, they're not directing that just to people coming to church. They're directing it to people 
who are installed as leaders at the church or trying to assert influence in the church that are actually actually competing with the gospel of Christ. Now, in Jude, who are these shady people? Are they the Judaizers? At the pattern that Jude describes, Jude has an array of ways to insult these people. He says they're like Cain. He says they're like a tree that's twice dead. He compares them to falling angels in Sodom and Gomorrah, to this weird guy named Balaam and talks about them as if they were stormy waves. In these 25 verses, he's insulted them on so many levels. The pattern of these things that he's trying to illustrate does not suggest that these are people who want the church to become Jewish in order to follow Christ. That's not the pattern we're seeing here. So who are Jude's dudes? Well, you know, we have to get into the context of Second Temple Judaism. Now we're going to get more into the thought world of the people who wrote these letters because he lists so many different things. We're trying to figure out how do we figure out what he's actually teaching against. Part of learning to read the Bible more richly is to humble ourselves to realize that we actually don't all the time know exactly what the author's talking about. And I have this experience with the book of Jude. And so I'm inviting you with me into the research uh, where we attempt to understand what is going on in the thought world of the author to the best of our ability. Now, uh, he's pulling some allusions, right? He calls them like Cain, like Balaam, like fallen angels, like Sodom and Gomorrah. These are things you've probably heard before because they're part of the Old Testament canon. But he also quotes and thinks and adds color from Second Temple Judaism books. Now, what we mean here, the first temple is Solomon's temple, and it was destroyed in 586 BC by the Babylonians. The Israelites went into exile, as you know, and when they came back, they actually restored the temple. There was a period of time, we have the, what we call the intertestamental period. That does not mean that nothing was written then. Uh, there are some books of the Bible that were written uh, then that are installed in other people's canons, like the Catholic canon has what's called the Apocrypha. They have books called Maccabees, and they're, they're helpful. We don't canonize them, meaning that we don't assume that they have the authoritative, inspired by God stamp of approval that the early church gave on the rest of scripture. But what we do assume is that they are helpful in understanding where uh, the thought world of these early Jews during the time of Christ would have been thinking about. How were they interpreting messianic hope? How were they interpreting the role of God in their lives? A lot of that literature ends up being uh, literature, it's almost uh, fan fiction, uh, you could think of it that way, where a, a writer in modern their modern day would have picked up an old story from the Old Testament and elaborated on it. And uh, so if you're familiar with fan fiction, maybe w this is a, a good way to think of some of these Second Temple Judaism books, like the Book of Enoch, like the Assumption of Moses, both of which are, are referenced in this letter from Jude. Are, are you following me? Jude is using the literature of the day to pull some ideas out of, just as if I was like quoting something from Katniss Everdeen or from Harry Potter. Potter. I'm using uh, references to things that you would be familiar with in order to make a point. I'm going to pick out one to show you what I mean. I'm going to pick out the, the, the this allusion to Balaam, because Balaam not only has a role in the Old Testament canon that you can read about, and you're like, what does he mean? You don't really get an insult if you don't understand what they're meaning. If I called you Benedict Arnold, and you didn't know who Benedict Arnold was, you might not be offended. But if you knew exactly the historical context of Benedict Arnold, you'd be offended. So we're trying to figure out what is what is Jude trying to say? And and if, follow me out here, if we, if we follow this thought world, we might be able to see what it is that he finds problematic in these people. Because if I were to call you a Benedict Arnold, what I'm saying is that you're a traitor, right? So uh, just saying a name that you know is negative isn't enough. It's what did that negative person do? Are you following me? These are illusions, they're tropes. Let me see if I can bring this a little bit more in the world of today. If I were to reference something at your sports career and I said, you know, you're just a Lance Armstrong. I'm accusing you of doping. 
the accusation mirrors what's going on in this illusion, this trope. If I were to say that you have the eloquence of Donald Trump, regardless of where you land politically, I think you know I would be insulting you because he's not very eloquent. He's a rhetorician, not very well spoken. If I said, you know, you guys were dating and I was like, you know, watch out. He seems like a Hans to me. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Someone is quick to commit, but maybe for their own gains. It wouldn't be a nice thing to say if I said they were like a Hans. Are you, are you getting what I'm getting at? They're tropes. They're, they're, they're classic bad guys that he's pulling from his own thought world. And he's saying, these guys are like Balaam. So let's dig into that. Colin and Balaam, what do you mean, Jude? What are you accusing them of? So let me read this real quick. I'm going to dialogue a little bit here with an... A historian, a Jewish historian in in the first century, I believe, named Philo, and he has some elaborations. Like I said, this kind of fan fiction vibe where they pick up a story and they comment on it and they flesh it out a little bit and they add in their own colorations. Philo would have been contemporaneous literature. He would have represented what people thought about Balaam. When I said Balaam and you're in the first century and you're a Jew and I accuse you of being Balaam, what is What is it that I'm accusing you of? Well, let's take a look. Balaam, with the help of Philo, had become a model false teacher, taking much of the contours from the original account in Numbers 22 through 25. You can visit that if you want. Philo's expansion fills in some gaps. The narrative has a foreign king, Balak, hiring out a prophet to curse incoming Israel. After a period of negotiation, Balaam takes the job. In the Old Testament, God nudges Balaam to accept. In Philo, it takes Balaam's palms being generously greased to offer his words. In other words, Balaam took a bribe. After failing to curse Israel, Balaam's next project, as Numbers 31, 16 confirms, is to draw Israel into idolatrous sensuality at Baal Peor. In other words, he was like, dude, it's totally fine if you just indulge your passions. Again, Philo expands this embarrassing episode as Balaam arranges his trap for the young men of Israel by colluding with the women of Moab and coaching them in harlotry. Wow. He, his work leads to the seducing of their minds which brought them into impiety. So let me try to tie a bow on this. If you read the Old Testament canon and you read the literature at the time that Jude would have been writing this letter, Balaam, he's a false teacher that takes money to teach, and he ultimately is interested in other people's destruction. Well, the gospel doesn't license you to do whatever you want. It gives you the freedom of Christ, which is uh, not self-serving and not self-centered. So what can be said of these infiltrators, these people that Jude is concerned about? It seems like they're influenced by a philosophy of the day called Epicureanism. These infiltrators are influencers, agents of ungodliness, threats to the community, and in imminent danger of judgment. Jude is caricaturizing his opponents. He is using some really not very nice terms to call these people to indicate how much of a threat they are to the church. If if someone asserted influence that because you're secure in Christ, that you don't have to follow a life of obedience, that would be problematic. A scholar named uh, Peter Davids described it as a group whose ethical behavior might be characterized as giving into desire and whose rationale for such behavior might include a denial of final judgment. Do you see how that might be problematic to the Christian? That the message I give you, if I were to get in front of you and say, dude, do you want to do something? Just do it, man. Neolo. So hopefully, hopefully, someone would notice that Ethan's gone off the deep end. We need to call him out. You could call me a Balaam. What I want to get at here is that, that I believe Jude is actually giving these people an on-ramp toward their redemption. That they're asserting an influence within the life of the church that's not only destructive for the church, 
and for their believers, fellow believers' faith, but for their own soul. Remember, these letters would have been read out loud to the whole community. When you got a, an epistle from one of these church leaders, and you, you would gather as a church and you would read it out loud as a whole. So the people that Jude is talking about are in the room. Jude either leaves the infiltrators unaddressed, uh, so the ready to fight church can make up their own mind what to do, or more likely he lays the path their salvific restoration. Perhaps he's trying to scare the hell out of them. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just I just said that. Sometimes we need to call each other out on stuff, and that's okay. That's part of the New Testament. It's part of the richness we learn from these letters. And Jude is very inventive in doing that, using all kinds of allusions and tropes from the Old Testament canon and from Second Temple Judaism. He has a lot of colorful ways to describe the people that he finds their behavior and their ideas problematic. But in doing so, in doing so, this rhetoric can be redemptive. Guys, we actually have the opportunity to call one another out. If we're not living up to, to the gospel, if we're not living up to Christ and, and his character and the story of God, we can call each other out and it's okay. And I, I don't know that Jude is, is necessarily giving you a license to insult, so to speak. But I think the idea is clear. If we are saying or doing things that is bad for the community of Christ, well, we need to call it out on each other. Maybe envision it this way, to use another pop culture reference. Think of Worm Tongue. He's bad advice. He's not interested in Rohan. He's not interested in the kingdom. He's not interested in what is happening around him. He's only interested in himself. And bad advice from selfish people is never good for the kingdom. We need to be able to call worm tongue out. We need to be able to talk about things that are problematic. And so we don't see a conflict averse community in the New Testament. In fact, when they find disagreement, they press into it and they try to figure out how to navigate that as redemptively as possible. And sometimes it may well involve calling it out. I hope we're picking up some, some study tools as we go along, that we're starting to learn some questions to ask as we're going through someone else's mail that will help us to get more out of the New Testament. Instead of being intimidated by entering a conversation we're not sure what's aware with, we're learning to, to ask simple questions that keep us in a state of humility toward the text, in a state of wonderment uh, as we attempt to, to understand what God is saying the New Testament church community can look like as we follow Jesus together and participate in the story of God. So perhaps the book of Jude has made us a little bit more aware that the thought world of the people in that were writing these letters can help us to illustrate and understand what they were trying to say. So keep asking questions, keep reading deeply, and keep seeing that these words, these letters that were, were written across the, the ancient Roman world, sent across the Mediterranean Roman road, that these correspondences, in fact, hold a lot of treasure for us in our pursuit of living out the Christ community today. All right, we got one more of these snail mail tales next week, and I am excited to study with you. I hope this has been helpful. Godspeed.